It's astounding how much human behavior is completely explainable, predictable, and therefore exploitable. Interestingly enough, I realized this while studying something completely devoid of emotions, physics. The best thing about earning my degree in physics is that it's given me a framework to understand the world. And I don't just mean the motions of the stars or the way time and space play together. The most surprising thing about a subject with so much math, a cold and personal, but a highly useful discipline that everyone who completes it automatically earns a minor in mathematics is how it's helped me to understand other people on this planet. Physics gave me a new way to see the world, grasp subtle nuances about life, and get more out of my short time on this planet. Making the connection between the external world and my internal state of mind improved my mental health, well-being, and satisfaction with life. And earning that degree was probably the second most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. Only behind having a newborn while writing my upcoming book, Hard Lessons from the Hurt Business, Boxing, and the Art of Life, and only slightly ahead of an eight-week training camp for a fight. And like all difficult things, I came away not only with new skills to tackle new problems, but also with a new perspective to help me understand old ones, like the behavior of other people. Before we jump into those perspectives, because there are bound to be questions about this, because every time people find that I study physics, they ask me some variation of the following question. I want to tell you the very condensed story of why I came to study physics in the first place. When I was 29, I went back to school with a plan to major in math. I wanted to study some type of engineering because I saw those guys make good money and job satisfaction was high, but I was in the middle of my boxing career and figured that I'd have to miss quite a bit of class. Since you can't become an engineer without the lab science and you can't take the lab science classes online, I opted for math, figuring that I'd have a foundation for all types of interesting, high paying quantitative work. I enlisted in the Army National Guard to get money for school and to be able to continue my boxing career in between the one week in a month, two weeks a year commitment. While going through AIT, the basic training after basic training for all my viewers who have not served and those who have know exactly what AIT is anyway, I fell in love with electrical engineering while going through a six week basic maintenance course in the Army's Ordnance School at Fort Lee, which is now called Fort Greg Adams because everything is offensive to everyone, but that's a different topic. In the electronics course, uh, before I started my real training in the military, for my job there, my military occupational specialty was a 94 Alpha, or a land combat and electrical systems repair. At that point, I said, you know what? I'm going to figure this lab class thing out. It was actually never an issue, but one of those lab classes I was afraid of missing was physics. For an experiment with projectile motion, we had to predict where a marble would land based on the angle of the ramp and the marble's mass. Despite the effects of imperfect measurement and the error that's inherent with all science experiments, my marble landed exactly where I marked the tape multiple times. And I said, yo, this shit is like magic. This is what I want to study. And to make a three year story of sleep deprivation and wondering if I'd ever actually understand quantum mechanics or tensors, I graduated from Duquesne University with a very expensive piece of paper, a surprisingly small amount of debt, and a few years shaved off my life from juggling the training load of a professional fighter and a full time physics student. My GPA wasn't horrible either. It wasn't great, but it did start with the number three. The last part is important. I wasn't a bad math student, but it was definitely not my strong point. Most of my classmates had like savant level, Rain Man level talents with math. My strength was being able to visualize the ideas and make sense of the counterintuitive. I was able to do this because I connected many of the ideas to something I knew very well, human behavior. The rest of this video is a list of some of the most interesting connections I made between the workings of the universe and the behavior of the people who reside in it. Hopefully you can use these connections to better predict when a relationship with your fellow humans has the potential to go sour, but also how to recognize when you've got a great setup in your life to begin with. But first, I have to give a shout out to Shortform for sponsoring today's video. Now, I left out an important part of my journey of getting a physics degree. I spent an entire year learning math from scratch because I was a terrible student in high school from which I actually didn't graduate from who had no confidence in my academic abilities. If there had been something like short form around when I was younger, I think school would have been a lot easier for me and it wouldn't have taken me so long for me to finally finish college. Short form is a book summary platform where you can get detailed summaries of over 1000 popular nonfiction books. They have summaries ranging on books from philosophy to history to psychology to some of the latest New York Times bestsellers. While putting together this video essay, I checked out some of Barbara Oakley's work, 
including a mind for numbers. It's a favorite of mine because she outlines how we think about math and how we can all get better at it. I also discovered that she'd written other books about learning, and if you've been watching my videos, you know how much I love learning. Along with Book Summary, Short Form also offers well-researched original articles that explain popular trends and current events, complete with references and citations to support their arguments. While Short Form may market itself as a book summary platform, it is also a great place to learn faster and understand the social and political trends of the day. To check out Short Form, use my link shortform.com slash edlatimore for a one-week trial, and if you stay on with them after your trial ends, you get a 20% discount on your subscription, but only if you use the code in the link. The link is in both the pinned comment and in the description. Once again, thank you to Shortform for sponsoring the video. Now, back to some metaphors and insights from physics that will help you understand human behavior. Albert Einstein's theories of special and general relativity lead us to a few interesting conclusions about the universe. The most relevant two to this discussion are, one, nothing exists by itself. There is no such thing as a thing by itself because objects are always defined in terms of the relationship to something else. And two, people can objectively observe the same event differently and because of their unique speed or position, both be correct in their interpretation. These two ideas are powerful concepts that can increase your happiness on this planet. Your social connections tremendously impact the quality of your life. You need to spend time with close friends and loved ones. And if you don't have any friends, make some. I dropped a video on how to do that in the description. You are the happiest when you're surrounded with other humans because humans are social creatures. Furthermore, know that you can never really be alone. The universe itself demonstrates this principle. Even light, the fastest thing in the universe, follows the curves created by other objects. Nothing travels its path without being influenced by what surrounds it. In our darkest hour, it's easy to believe that no one understands our plight, but this is untrue. Someone's had it worse. Someone understands. Someone's made it through and can teach you how to do the same thing. Either for instruction or love, you're never lacking in the universe. You are never really alone. Additionally, general relativity states that observers moving at different speeds or in different gravitational fields experience time differently. For example, a clock on a spaceship moving near the speed of light ticks slower than one on Earth. But both measurements are correct from their respective reference frames. Now, for this time dilation effect to occur in the real world, you'd have to be going pretty fast, at least 10% of the speed of light, if I recall. Like, nothing travels that fast. Even a crackhead can't run that fast. So remember, a lot of these ideas aren't to be taken literally. The point is that two different people, because of their different backgrounds, experiences, and knowledge, can have different subjective feelings about objective facts, especially if they're moving through life at dramatically different paces. One of the greatest wastes of time is arguing with people to change their feelings about something because it's perfectly reasonable for intelligent people to look at the same facts and have two different emotional reactions. And because we're emotional creatures who, for better or worse, make most of our decisions, even the important ones, based on how we feel, you're in for a rough time on this rock if you don't figure out how to live with people who think and feel differently than you about something, even if it's so obvious to you what is the correct way to feel. Just as the laws of physics confirm that two observers can witness the same event differently and both be right, we gotta accept that different perspectives in life are equally valid, or at the very least that every person is entitled to their own perspective and rarely does anything good or productive come from attacking or diminishing it. Each moment spent in denial of this is a moment of unnecessary misery you inflict on yourself. You have less time on this planet than you think. Don't waste it over things or arguing over things you can't do anything about. Another basic principle in physics tells us what happens when we decide to expend energy trying to change a heart that's firmly entrenched in its feelings. The formula for work is force times distance. It doesn't matter how much force you apply to something. Anything multiplied by zero is zero. So if it doesn't change position, then no work has been accomplished. The only thing that happened, both physically and psychologically, is that you exerted a lot of energy and the thing you're pushing against pushed back stronger. Newton's third law of motion, which states that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, is a good model to describe what happens when you push against something. But in the case of people, it goes even further, seemingly defying physics. 
trying to convince someone they're wrong about something usually doesn't cause them to change the position. In fact, what tends to happen is a type of negative work where the more you try to push them towards your way of thinking, the more it reinforces their original belief and pushes them away. This type of behavior isn't conducive to working or getting along with other humans on this planet, let alone forming a relationship with them. And when it comes to forming relationships, romantic, platonic, business, or otherwise, let's borrow a lesson from mathematics. When two things are equal, they're interchangeable. As a result, you don't need both of them. However, when two things are complementary, they are different, but both are needed for completeness. Like charges repel and opposites attract. This fundamental principle of physics elegantly applies to human relationships. Just as electrons and protons form stable atoms through their opposing charges, relationships often thrive on complementary differences rather than similarities. The more similar you are to someone, the less necessary one of you becomes in a functional sense. This isn't to say that shared values aren't important, they absolutely are. But when two people bring identical strengths, perspectives, and capabilities to a relationship, they may find themselves occupying the same space, creating friction rather than harmony. And that's assuming they can coexist at all. As another fundamental rule of Newtonian or classical physics says that no two objects can occupy the same space. Side note, I hope any hardcore physics folks watching this appreciated me making the distinction of Newtonian physics. For everyone else, this happens in quantum mechanics. In the non-quantum real world relationships, two people who are extremely similar may also create an atmosphere of subtle competition that undermines the relationship. Two highly analytical people might constantly try and one-up each other's reasoning. Two creative types might compete for recognition rather than collaborate. Two dominant personalities might struggle for leadership rather than finding a balanced dynamic. And it's not so much that opposites attract in the conventional sense. It's more that complementary traits don't impede or infringe upon one another. They create space for the other person to shine in their own domain while appreciating what the other person brings to the table. Our strengths and weaknesses take on meaning through our interactions with others. A person who balances your tendencies, someone who brings calm to your storm or energy to your steadiness, creates a relationship with a broader range of capabilities than either one of you possess alone. Think of it as creating a more complete system. An introvert and an extrovert might balance out each other beautifully, one handling deep one-on-one -on -one connection while the other builds a broader social network. A dreamer pill paired with a pragmatist can turn vision into reality. A risk taker with a more cautious partner might achieve bold goals without unnecessary danger. This complementary approach doesn't mean seeking your polar opposite in every way. Rather, it suggests finding someone whose differences enhance your strengths and compensate for your blind spots. The key is recognizing which differences create positive tension and propel growth and which create destructive friction. Just as complementary personalities create powerful relationships, there's an even deeper principle at work when we connect with one another. When you link up with a person in the same frequency, you can accomplish more than the sum of your parts. Resonant frequencies happen when two waves match up perfectly and make each other stronger. Just like when you push against the swing at just the right moment to make it go even higher. This amplification effect occurs in physics and it's equally true in human connections. When two people are aligned in purpose and timing, their combined impact can be exponentially greater than what either one could achieve alone. It becomes one plus one equals seven. And the mathematician and you might object, but your heart understands this profound truth about human synergy. However, there is a corollary to this that is also true. When two waves have the opposite frequency, their interference cancels out both of their individual properties. Analogously, a bad relationship brings out the worst of both individuals to the point that neither of them are useless. This wave theory of relationships explains why Tommy and alignment matter so much. Two brilliant, kind, and talented people might destructively interfere with each other if their fundamental frequencies, their values, goals, or communication styles are consistently out of phase. Meanwhile, two seemingly ordinary individuals might create extraordinary outcomes when they resonate perfectly. The science of wave interference teaches us to be selective about our connections. Not everyone who complements your strengths will also resonate with your frequency. The strongest relationships have both complementary attributes and resonant timing. 
different enough to expand your capabilities, aligned enough to align to amplify your impact. So pay attention to those relationships where your combined efforts seem almost magically effective. These are your resonant connections, the people with whom your wave patterns synchronize to create something greater than either of you could manifest alone and be equally mindful of connections that seem to drain both parties of their natural power. These are the destructive interferences that physics warns us about. And everyone who's ever taken physics, even if they didn't major in it, has learned something about Newton's three laws of motion. Here's a quick refresher. An object at rest stays at rest, and an object's motion stays in motion unless acted upon. We call that inertia. Change in an object's position requires force. That's F equals MA. And when you push a pull on something, that thing pushes or pulls back on you with the same strength but in an opposite direction, i.e. every action has an equal and opposite reaction. What's cool about these laws is that with just these three laws, everything outside of relativity in the quantum realm can be calculated with precision, which means you can predict how something will move. While there are analogs to Newton's three laws in human behavior and like Newton's laws, once you know them, you can predict how people will behave. First, inertia and in human action. People don't act unless pushed or stopped unless interrupted. All living organisms assume the most energy efficient configuration. This is the most general way to say, we all choose the easiest way possible. It's Coach Boone, and remember the Titans once said, I don't scratch my head unless it itches, and I don't dance unless I hear music. The corollary to this is that a person, is that if a person is allowed to do something that benefits them, they'll continue to do it, even if it hurts other people. If you don't stop bad behavior at its start, you'll have to deal with worse behavior that's armed with the advantage of momentum. This principle explains why habits are so powerful, yet so difficult to change. Just as objects at rest tend to stay at rest, we resist changing our routines until sufficient force, whether through motivation, necessity, or crisis, compels us to action. Our behavior, our behavioral inertia keeps us in a comfortable pattern unless disrupted by a stronger force. Consider how many of us continue scrolling through social media despite intending to do something productive or how organizations maintain outdated processes simply because that's how we've always done it. The path of least resistance becomes the default trajectory to mediocrity. The second law, the force of social influence. The force of influence equals the apparent intention of the attempt times the importance of the attempter. In other words, who says what and what they're trying to do. The easiest way to shape behavior is by relying on authority. If you can couple authority with intentions that appeal to a person's need for safety and security, you can achieve massive influence. Just as force accelerates an object proportionally to the mass involved, the impact of social influence increases with the perceived importance of its source. We see this in how celebrity endorsements move markets and how respected leaders inspire action and even how trusted sources shape our beliefs. This explains why we're more likely to take health advice from a doctor than from a random stranger and why companies pay influencers to promote their products. The greater the perceived authority or relevance to the source, the stronger its ability to change our behavior. And the third law of social action and reaction. Every social movement has an equal and opposite counter movement. Most social progress is merely an overcorrection of previously held ideas and assertions. The pendulum always swings back the other way. This describes the cyclical nature of social change. For every push in one ideological direction, expect an eventual pushback. We see this pattern throughout history. Periods of conservatism, followed by progressivism, individualism, collected collectivism, and traditionalism manifested and answered by modernism. This law reminds us that social change rarely moves in a straight line. Instead, it oscillates between extremes before potentially finding balance. Understanding this can help us anticipate resistance to new ideas and recognize when our own reactions might be part of a larger pendulum swing rather than a measured response. By recognizing these Newtonian patterns in human behavior, we gain insight into both personal habits and broader social dynamics, allowing us to work with these forces rather than against them. For more insight into what makes a romantic relationship work and what you should do, watch this video here. And if you don't have any friends and desperately want to make some, watch this video here.